Hi everyone, welcome to another round of Irishep Fellowship Talks. Today we have Ishan and Rahul. Up first we have Ishan. Ishan was mentored by Jean Chen. Uh, Jean Chen, you want to say a few words to introduce Ishan's work? Sure. Um, so Ishan's work is about um, enabling the capability of pushing back the credit execution to the client. So traditionally in Skyhook DM, the query would be offloaded to the OSDs, uh, no matter in what kind of situation. But when the OSDs are overloaded, it is more it, it is possibly more uh, profitable to move the function and being executed by the client instead. And so um, this project um, executed by Ishan is trying to enable this capability. And thanks so much he, for his um, good work. And I think that's it. For, this, for the introduction. Go ahead, Ishan. I think we we'll right. can start the presentation. Okay, sounds good. Hi, I'm Ishan. I'm a Cross OSRE student and an IRS HEP fellow. The project I'm working on is Skyhook DM, a UC Santa Cruz incubator project. And I'm specifically working on the ability to push back query execution to the client in case of overloaded OSDs. And my mentor is John Chen Liu. A bit of background about Skyhook is that it's a client server architecture, which comprises of the Arrow dataset API and the Ceph distributed file system. The goal of Skyhook is to transparently shrink and grow storage and processing needs as demand change. And um, it takes different file formats as input. For example, the parquet file format. Uh, in the parquet file format, the file is partitioned by its rows, and each partition is written to Ceph, uh, and these partitions are what are read and filters get applied to. Uh, so a partition has rows, and this is what is stored and processed by the storage. So work is offloaded to Ceph to process rather than the client doing the work, and the Arrow Dataset API allows the definition of SQL style expressions to filter data when reading data from the files. Normally, these expressions are applied after the client receives the data from a source or file system, but with the Skyhook project, these expressions are applied at the server side. This is because Skyhook creates custom read methods that are added to Ceph that allows the storage layer to execute these read methods uh, on the data when it's read from the local disk. Uh, this offloading computation to storage servers reduces the data sent to the client which in turn reduces the uh, data sent over a network. Additionally, all the work is distributed across multiple storage servers. So uh, not all the work is done on a single client. However, a problem arises in that the storage servers in Ceph may be busy. If the clients are always pushing down computation, the, store, the server may become overloaded. In this case, they may want to reject the request to apply the expressions to the data. Therefore, for improved performance, it may be optimal to push back the filtering to the client. Therefore, the expressions along with the file stored on the server will be pushed back to the client. And the solution is to apply the expressions pushed back to the unprocessed data that is also returned at the client. The old assumption was that this data uh, was the resultant table was returned from the client um, and the filtering was done on the server. In terms of progress, we have finished the main pushback functionality for the parquet file format. We have better resource estimation and we can also support the feather file format, but we are working on getter, getting better resource estimation and for benchmarking, we're working on three cases where the pushback is always enabled versus when it's never and versus when it's dynamic. At a high level, the implementation is to iterate over a parquet files rows and columns to find the total uncompressed size of the file in bytes. This iteration is done over the metadata of the parquet file. So the overhead of making the pushback decision on the server side is negligible. Then we must compare that value to a threshold representing the available RAM of the system and we must also compare the CPU load from the sysinfo API at the one minute load average to another threshold representing the system load. 
In this case, we return a predefined status code representing pushback, but we also must create a status detail class uh, representing this code because from the server side, we must return an arrow OK status with the detail of the pushback code. The expressions and the unprocessed data are returned from the server in a buffer list. And at the client, if the scan op returns the above code, we apply the filtering. This is a high level figure of what's going on. Um, at the client, we push down a request to the OSD. The request has different uh, things in it that are serialized, such as the file format and the file size and the various expressions. And we have two cases, the non-pushback and the pushback. When we're doing the non-pushback, only the resultant table is returned to the client after the expressions are applied to the file on the server. Whereas on the pushback case, the file and the expressions are returned to the client. And at the client, the expressions will be applied to the file uh, to get the resultant table. Here, I'll show you a bit of the code at a high level. Um, so this is at the client. And what happens here is the pushdown computation request uh, through the scan op function. And the input is a request buffer list and a result buffer list. Right now, the result will have nothing in it, but it, it could either have the resultant table or the file along with the uh, expressions in the pushback case. And as I mentioned before, the request has different things serialized within it, such as um, the file format and the file size and the expressions. In the scan op case over here, we first must get a file from the random access object. Then we must create a parquet reader to get the file metadata. And we need the file metadata to get the number of row groups and column groups because we must iterate over each row of the parquet file and iterate over each of the columns to get the uncompressed size. Here we have a variable representing the total uncompressed size of the file. And uh, first we get the row group group metadata after iterating over the number of rows. Uh, and then we must also iterate over each column uh, in each row to get the total uncompressed size of the column metadata. And we add this to the total bytes in the file. And if the total bytes in the file are greater than the available RAM threshold or the system load at the one minute average is greater than the system load threshold, we return the file inside the output buffer with the CLS CXX read. And this is the status detail class implemented because we must return uh, an arrow OK status code. This lets us specify uh, the pushback code within the OK code. Um, and yeah, over here, if the code is zero, we return an arrow OK status code. But if it's greater than zero, we represent the pushback code with a predefined status code. And we use the class beforehand to return. And at the client, once we get the detail, if the detail code represents the pushback code, we apply the filtering the same way as we do in the server. Uh, yeah, thank you. I would like to thank Cross and Iris Hep for giving me the opportunity to work with Skyhook. And I would also like to thank my mentor, John Shen Lu, for his help. Any questions? Any questions for, uh, for Ishan? Uh, yeah, I have a question, or maybe two. So let me understand the 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 server could be um, busy for a variety of reasons. I guess it could be um, IO, you know, there's, there's an IO load or there's a CPU load, um, or maybe not IO load. I don't know, maybe this is all in, all the data is in memory on the server, but I guess I was just wondering is if it's, if it's um, IO load, you know, like disk load, then does it actually help to send the file back? Because I mean, it has to transfer the file back to the, to the client. So I guess a little bit more about the problem this is trying to solve. Is it is it mainly thinking that the server will be CPU bound doing these uh, queries and, and then it can just say, hey, I'm too busy, I'll give you the file back and then you can do it on the client CPU. Is that the main um, problem you're trying to solve? 
Yeah. Um, like if there are a bunch of different clients that uh, want the server to apply like expressions uh, to a file, um, like if the if the uh, memory pressure is high, um, then it would just return the file to the client and that's the, along with the expressions, and that's the problem we're trying to solve. Okay, so mostly thanks. Thanks you found. Yeah, go ahead. Thanks for the question. I think this is a really good point. Um, so actually the, the system load information actually also consider, considering the, the, as you said, also considering the, the IO load status. Um, in that case, it could be the IO load bottleneck on the on accessing the storage, or also the IO load bottleneck on accessing the network. And so, in that case, um, we may yes, this is a good point. And so, I think we may need to identify that situation because, yeah. in any way, we need to read the data or, or send the result back to the client. Yeah, if your IO, so, if it's either network or disk or something, yeah. then you might not be any better off by sending, you know, then you have to transfer mm -hmm. file and data, it might not be, but for CPU, I can see, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, this is a good point. And then, so uh, yeah, a, we a, may need a related, to. A related question is, so I assume that the client saw, I mean, I think about, the, the client has all the client software has everything needed to do this query to do this to execute this this uh, query. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's yes. So it's almost it's like a symmetric situation where the client and the server both have this capability software wise and services wise, but the it's just that you send this to a server because you know you can aggregate resources and stuff. But once it sends it back to the client, it can do the same query that the server can do, like it's built in the client software. Exactly, because both of them, both of the two sides are just utilize utilize the the error processing stack. And so, it, as long as you have the the the, the client side, it has the liberators, and when you want to offload the the uh, if you if the client side has the error process stack, the error library installed it, and so it just can use the error um, API to do the same thing. As, as okay. a server. Yeah, right. Thank you. Yeah. It's an interesting question. If you send it back, I mean, imagine you wanted to, I mean, let's take the ridiculous case of mm -hmm. you're trying to make this query on your phone, right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It may be, it may be when you push back that some clients might not actually have the capabilities of, uh, of doing the kind of querying, but if it's just some events, maybe it's fine. But yeah, as you put, I mean, the server can be controlled, but clients can't be controlled. You have no idea what uh, you don't control the available resources on the client. And it just occurred to me that maybe some clients might not do as well as even, even if the server's overloaded, it might do better than some clients, but. Yeah, this is, this is good direction. I mean, this project right now is just to enable this kind of pushback capability. And then in the future, we may need to involve some kind of machine learning to evaluate latency on the client side versus latency execution on the server side, and then do some kind of trade off in the in between when between before doing send back or offload function. Yeah, I mean, this is kind so of just, just yeah yeah. What, what you've done is you've just made the capability available now, yeah. which is great. It's extra functionality, yeah. but there's some policy and some other aspects that might need to be exactly yeah. yeah. In the future, we may have a lot of like rooms improve this policy. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Any other questions for, for Ishan? No questions? Okay. Up next, we have Rahul. This is Rahul. I'm a final year undergraduate student at IIT Kharagpur from India. Uh, this summer, I got a chance to work on the Skyuk DM project through the Iris Have Fellowship program. Uh, my project was to integrate a benchmarking framework in Skyuk DM and automate the testing with the CI-CD pipelines. Before I start discussing about my project, let me briefly explain what is Skyhook DM. Skyhook is built using the SAP distributed storage file system, which leverages a programmable storage approach to provide data management functionality directly within the storage layer. It utilizes SAP's existing object class mechanism 
by developing customized C++ object classes and methods that enable database operations such as select, project, aggregate to be pushed down to the object storage layer. Skyo basically partitions the data and stores these partitions and object with thereby apply the implemented methods locally on the data. Now coming to my project, Skyo DM is a performance critical storage system and small changes in the source code often resulted in significant performance changes. So it was very important to keep track of all these changes so that the project can be saved from silent uh, degradation and can be made more robust. To overcome the problems, a benchmarking framework can be used to create benchmarks for all the performance critical parts of the source code. So benchmark are simple tests that execute some operations, operations which help to access the relative performance of an object. Once all the benchmark tests are written, a CI-CD pipeline can further be utilized to execute all these tests and as an add-on, some visuals like comparison plot uh, can be made using the results. So in the first phase, I started exploring a few of the open source benchmarking frameworks and uh, finally ended up using the Conbench. Conbench is developed by OrsaLab and it was used by the Apache Arrow project uh, that made it a, a great fit as per the requirements of our project. I wrote all the benchmarks that were needed to test the performance critical parts of Skyhook. Now as we are good to go with the benchmarking framework, I started working on the automation part. With the help of GitHub Actions, I made few workflows that executes all the benchmarks whenever a PR is raised and stored, stores the results in a different repository. The stored outputs are further being utilized by the Python script to generate some comparison plots that are quite easy to interpret. Uh, so you can see uh, some of the uh, visuals in this slide. Now as an enhancement, I further added a command bot that posed the output in the same PR thread, uh, making it much easier for the maintainers to get the result at same place and it was also very helpful for the new contributors uh, who are raising pull requests for the first time in this Skyhook DM repo. Uh, so let me briefly summarize the whole workflow. At first a github action build is triggered whenever a contributor raises a PR in the main Skyhook DM repo. The main job of the workflow is to build the latest Skyhook DM uh, docker image uh, consisting of all the changes made by the contributor as soon as the job is finished it triggers another build in the benchmarks repo using the uh, webhooks where here all the benchmark tests are executed with the help of conbench and all the json outputs that are generated uh, are stored in a well structured format once all the results are available the python scripts are executed which further generates the plot these plots are further being utilized by the command bot that I just showed. Uh, that was a quick overview of my project. I hope that I explained it well. I will be very happy to answer all the questions of any. Uh, you can also reach me at my mail address mentioned in this slide. So thank you everyone. Bye bye. Thank you Rahul. That's all we have for today. Thank you to Rahul and Ishan and thank you to their mentors.